Hey guys, John back with another Antiguru video and answering a question I think a lot of you have been asking on the expert community group, which is backland development. How do we do it? How do we get away with it? What do we need to look for? That kind of thing. In fact, it was just generically asked backland development question mark. And so, you know me, I like to do what you guys want me to do. So I'm going to talk about a case that is from my own caseload. And the case in question concerns 55, 57 and 59 Green Lane in Shepparton, Sunbury on Thames, Surrey. This is in the borough of Spelthorne. Now, the case in question relates to an area of land at the back of these three houses. What the client had done is a deal, a land assembly deal with these three owners. He'd done a deal to buy a portion of land at the back, equivalent to about 24 meters of garden at the back of each one of these houses. And they came to us and said, right, we've got this land, what do we do? Now, the land in question is, is primed for backland development for a few different reasons. Firstly, if we look at the character of development on Catherine Drive, and we specifically go here, we've got four rather neat and tidy houses in a two pairs of semis with a really nice defined plot depth, a really nice defined relationship to the street, everything kind of works. And then if we go on to the opposite side of the road, we've got a pair of houses there. Again, really nicely defined plot depth, really good relationship to the street, and it keeps going and going. There's another three houses there, there's another two houses there, etc., etc. What we're seeing is a patination, and that patination shows us what we need to look for in terms of development in backland settings. Now, because this was an option agreement subject to the grant of planning permission, because this is essentially speculative, what we did was we put this on the permission in principle full planning route through the system. Now, permission in principle is still relatively new. Precious few councils really understand what they're doing with it. But what it gets the council to agree is, is the principle of development acceptable? Now, the beauty about doing a permission in principle on a site like this is that it keeps the initial cost low. It's much cheaper than a pre-app and moreover, it's legally binding. The plans you put in are very simple, very basic. You ask the council a simple question. Is the access to the street okay? Is the principle of putting houses here okay? Now the argument that we presented obviously is that the principle of putting houses on this site was absolutely fine. And what I've done for you guys is loaded up a few screens, essentially, just taking you through the pathway that this one followed. So that was our Virgin site. I'll just drop it onto the street view. And again, we're using Nimbus here, thanks to our good colleagues and friends at Nimbus Maps to give you an idea. So opposite, that's that pair of houses. They're a pair of bungalows. And then we have a two-story character. So this is the odd pair out. We have a two-story character. Then we swing around. Those are those semi-detached. They sit alongside. Here is our site and plot. Beautiful separation distances, absolutely stunning. Down to a mixed character again of one and a half and two story dwelling. So mixed character, good separation distance, plot depth that works. Everything looks fine and dandy on the face. So if I've got this right, this should be the screen I want to show you first. And there is our plot. If I zoom out, I'll show you in a bit more detail. There is our four houses, and this was the plan that we submitted for permission in principle. Now, 
you can see four houses working very nicely they're all specced out as two bed at this stage two car parking spaces per dwelling plot sizes if i scroll up a little bit further to compare to number five and number seven up here that work very neatly with what's going on on the rest of Catherine Drive. The gardens work very well. Importantly, separation working this way as well. So we've got a good, this ended up being 10 meters side to rear. So you've got a really decent garden area for each one of those houses preserved. And that's consistent with what's going on over here. So in reality, this doesn't look too much. So let's have a look at what the council did. And here is the permission. So I'm now on Spellthorn's planning database and here is the permission, 2018 PIP. And we can see that permission in principle was granted. Now, what the council did was they had a look at our plans and they said, okay, we can see you might be able to fit four, but we'd kind of like two. So what they did was they gave us a maximum of two dwellings on this site instead of four. Now, that's because of the nature of a permission in principle. The PIP application protocol allows them to flex. So it allows them to turn around and say, well, actually, we're not so convinced that we can get four successful dwellings on this site. So, in absence of things like scale and height and mass, we're going to pin you back. We're going to pin you back to two. The council did that in this case. They had one look at the permission in principle and they said, well, you know what, we're not so convinced. So what we're going to do is we're going to pin you back to two dwellings on this application site. There's no problem with that because what I wanted the council to agree was the principle of chopping this plot, or in this case, these three plots. I wanted the council to agree to backland development. This is because at the time, the NPPF had a presumption that councils would try and control this on their own. So we weren't sure what Sunbury were gonna do, but they allowed it. And they allowed it for two, and that's the important thing. So let's move ourselves on a step. I'm going to move ourselves on a step to the planning application that follow. And all of the information I'm seeing, I'm showing you here is in the public domain. So if you want to go and have a look at it, you can Google this site and go and have a look. I know they're currently discharging planning conditions. So what we showed the planning authority was four very nice, well apportioned, two bedroom houses. But you'll notice here that we've got some stairs going up and those stairs going up take us in to the roof because what we ended up getting were four three bedroom houses now you'll notice there's been some changes to the way the car parking's laid out it's a bit more better apportioned you've got four nice neat plots again but now they're not flat to the street they're in a staggered pattern these were had a little bit of a stagger and the car parking was a little bit clustered here our patination got a little bit more staggered and our parking got segregated a little bit more so we didn't have the bank of cars we had a bit more segregation plot depth the same but importantly we're now allowing the council to assess design and here is the design of these houses so we've got four very nicely apportioned they're not handed pairs so they don't look identical they're not symmetrical they're not meant to be either. You've got four very nice offset pairs of houses, creating two pairs of four semi-detached houses with dormers up in the roof. Remember, of course, on the PIP, we started with two bedroom homes and the council said they didn't see that would be able to fit. So here we were pushing it a little bit. We were showing them more detail, giving them more to chew on. But of course, the principle of subdividing this plot has been assured. That has been dealt with by the permission in principle. Don't they look cool? Now that, remember, is in this character. Very boring, very dull, very drab. 1980s, pairs of semi-detached houses, not much going on there. And this mixed character here, 
And I'll show you, ladies and gentlemen, what the council did. There it is. So this is the planning permission. There it is, conditional permission. Hiding behind the town planning expert logo. Four, four, three bedroom, semi-detached homes with associated parking and amenity space. Backland development done right. Now, the main hints and tips that come out of this, I hope are fundamentally clear. But let's go over them again, just to make sure that it's all nice and crystal. Firstly, what we want to do is just move that logo a little bit and go on to the master map. We picked an area, the site was selected because there was surrounding character, because there was this patination of houses behind houses, houses situated in defined plots, a pattern that could be followed, a pattern that could be copied. Enough land was assembled in order to replicate that pattern. The depth and the width of the plot was well defined. 10 meters was given for those gardens because 10 meters complies with policy and it absolutely follows the line set on the other side of the road. The design was key. A good design, some interest on the front, well apportioned, slightly bulky in the roof, but the council didn't worry so much about that, which allowed the ability to put a dormer on the back. The, the dormer is well designed. It's not stupid in proportion. I mean, London, you may mainly see rail carriage style Portsmouth dormers, and this is not a Portsmouth dormer. So we had a lot going in our favour there. And finally, just to tick the boxes. Internal space standards that complied in full with the national standard. Toilets, ground floor cupboards, first floor cupboards, all of that going on. So complied in full with the national standards and because this is London, the London plan standard and because this is PTAL 2, all the car parking that we needed front and centre where everyone else puts their car parking. If we had car parking at the back, it would have made the plot more difficult. So we put car parking at the front and ensured visibility. And what I mean by ensured visibility is this. That fence is ours. So that fence comes down so that we can see up that road that way and we can see down the road that way in order that someone can reverse onto their own parking space or reverse out onto the road. This being a quiet residential road, so not a major through road. If it had been a major through road, it would be a different argument. Quiet residential road is the key there. Now, of course, we didn't have to worry about affordable housing here. We did have to worry about SIL and the existing outbuildings did help us a little bit there. Not a lot. They didn't give us a lot back, but they did help us a little bit there. Other than that, that was how we did backland. And I really hope that answers some of the questions that people have been asking in respect of how do we do backland development? What to look out for, what to not look out for. Now, on this site, there were a couple of little things to look out for. Windows. Remember I said we were 10 meters. We have windows here. We had to be 10 meters. We had to be a decent separation distance from the back of that property. Because if we weren't a decent separation distance from the back of that property, we were going to have an issue. And the issue would have been loss of light to a window, loss of privacy to a window. That also dictated design because there are no windows in the side elevations of these properties. It is front to back only. No side light. Again, we didn't want any argument over loss of privacy. This window here is a bathroom window, thankfully. You can tell it's a bathroom window. But happily, it is separated by a garage on its own plot. 
So we don't need to worry so much about loss of light to a bathroom window. We can get a bit closer. That's fine. And a side to side separation distance is OK. Bathroom windows don't enjoy the same level of protection under the Prescription Act that living room windows do, albeit there is a level of protection there. So one always has to be a little bit careful and maybe get on well with the neighbour. But fundamentally, most people accept that bathrooms don't need a light to them. The final thing about this and the key for all of this is the plot itself. And if I just draw that on for you, it looks something like this. That was the plot. That was the area of assembly. 690 square meters or thereabouts. And that was key, ladies and gentlemen, because it absolutely replicated what was going on in the street. It absolutely replicated how to get this to work properly and in a manner that would not seem out of character. A lot of these fail on out of character grounds, uh, but this one wasn't out of character, primarily because we were following the patination within the street. I really hope that helps you understand a little bit more about backline development by using a real case study. If you've enjoyed this video, hit like, hit subscribe. For if you want to get notified for the next one, please hit the bell and get your bell on. Absolutely, uh, that will notify you the next time I do a video. Thank you for watching The Anti-Guru. I'm, I'm always overjoyed when I see just so many people and I don't actually expect any of my videos to get watched. So I'm always overjoyed to see so many people watching my videos. I really hope it helps you and I'll catch you on the next one.